Welcome to our ongoing discussion of types of structural action from Chapter 1, Section 6. We've been focusing for quite a while on tension, and we're now doing our seventh uh, video on tensile structures or tensile elements. Uh, this one focusing on the Federal Reserve Bank. We have mentioned this bank previously, but we're going to go into a little more detail uh, in the light of previous discussions. Uh, the bank sits on a city block. It spans roughly 300 feet. So there's this plaza uh, that's open to the public. Uh, below the plaza are secure functions where major vehicles with currency and other valuables enter the underground domain. That's definitely a non-public environment. The plaza is public and then this portion of course is semi-public because people visiting the bank will go up to these upper floors, uh, but generally they also are fairly uh, secure. Um, the decision was made to span this 300 feet partly to uh, create uh, an isolation of this really secure zone down below, but also that zone has uh, special uh, requirements in terms of circulation of big trucks and various things. And it was pretty hard to set up a column grid that would pass through this without interfering with what was going on up there. So the decision was basically made to span over it. Um, so this is a section through the structure. These are long free span trusses that go from one side to the other. If I recall, it's like 70 or 80 feet, something on that order. And then it spans 300 feet uh, by virtue of this uh, tensile element in the opposite direction. So each of these floors is a huge column free floor. Um, several things we want to note. One is that this tensile element is very deep. The building is roughly 10 stories high and the suspension element is the full depth of the, depth of the structure. So it's actually 150 feet deep and it's spanning 300 feet. So it has a really superb depth to span ratio. And that's fairly crucial on a structure of this type because keep in mind we're supporting 10 floors of load. And so we might be designing for uh, an office live load of 80 pounds a square foot, uh, a concrete floor load of 50 pounds a square foot. This is very different from designing a suspension roof, for example, where we might have to deal with 15 pounds per square foot of snow load total. Here we might be talking about 130 pounds a square foot multiplied by 10 stories so 1300 pounds equivalent per square foot as opposed to something more on the order of 13. So structural efficiency becomes absolutely crucial with the system and choosing a deep sag allows this thing to have very good leverage effects and very good efficiency. Now one of the things that we didn't talk about before that we really should mention is this whole notion of circuitous or long stress paths. For example, a load on this top floor here in the center gets carried all the way down through these columns. So that load comes down here and then it has to get carried up this tensile element all the way to here and then it gets carried down to the foundations through this compression member. Now, we were only a few feet short of reaching a potential foundation there if this column had gone straight down. And rather than have that one short segment of very efficient column, we've had to go with all those loads along this rather circuitous stress path. The longer the stress path, the greater the potential for stretching or shortening of those members, and the greater the movement of the structure. And that becomes particularly crucial in a building like this we don't have to worry about that that much on a great suspension bridge, but on a building like this we do because there is glass everywhere in this facade. And so if you have deformation in the facade that follows some kind of a shear pattern like that, you basically are going to have lots of glass cracking, or at the very least you're going to heavily work the uh, rubber gaskets around the glass, which over time might cause them to leak. 
So this building actually uh, has probably had some difficulties of that sort, and I don't have first-hand evidence of that, but I've heard by rumor that there's a tendency for the facade to leak. So these are things that have to be considered. And it's very disturbing if you think, okay, well, we can design things like this suspension member. We can design it to be very efficient and still have adequate strength. But if we have to account for that stiffness issue, this member may need to be a lot stronger than we expected. And in fact, when we look at it, we discover that the tension or, or parabolic support member consists of two things. One is a wide flange steel element, which is 36 inches deep, and then a bunch of these high strength steel cables. So one of the characteristics of steel is, steel cable is that it's tremendously strong, but it also stretches a lot. Uh, the more load you add, the more it stretches. So it's kind of like the equivalent of a rubber band in terms of structural technology, and it has to be dealt with in a very careful way. If all there was in this wall was this uh, tensile steel, the wall would move too much under load when people come to work and as a consequence um, <clears throat> there would be a lot of deformation in the facade and either lots of glass breaking or else the requirement for very sophisticated uh, seals around the edges that would allow lots of movement to occur. In this particular building in fact the uh, steel cable was put there just to resist the gravity loads on the dead load portion. So in fact, as the building got built, um, this, the steel in those cables would stretch out and then it would get retensioned after that. So somewhere in here I have a photograph of that. This is the hydraulic mechanism that was used. So every time a floor got cast, the structure would change its shape a little bit and they go back and hydraulically adjust to uh, take up the uh, deformation. So <clears throat> in this structure, these cables bring everything to neutral under dead load, and there's no load at that time of any significance in this I section. So the question is, why do we have the I section there? We need that there to prevent elongation under live load. People come to work and the structure stress, it stretches. That deformation causes problems with the glass. So we need a lot of steel and it might as well be cheap steel. It doesn't have to be high strength steel strand because we couldn't tolerate the movements that the steel strand can tolerate. The glass just wouldn't be able to deal with that. So we use lower grade mild steel and add a bunch of it in the form of this I section. Again, I'll remind you, the elements above are acting as columns, delivering loads to this suspension structure. The elements below are acting as tension members, and they're rendered as thin slabs, one inch by eight inch. So when you look at them edge on, they almost disappear. They have almost no impact on the view. So this is what the structure looked like in the end. Here we have our suspension element. Oh, the other comment I want to make is this truss across the top, we mentioned that its purpose is to provide the horizontal force to hold the towers apart against the inward pull of this suspension element, which has got a horizontal component that's tending to pull the towers over. So here's a horizontal component, and there is the vertical component. The towers are much better designed to deal with this vertical component than they are with this horizontal component. So this truss across the top is a compression member to hold the towers apart. It is much deeper than it needs to be in order to serve that function. And this depth is actually there to account for deformations under asymmetric live load. For example, if there's something happening on the street out here and everybody rushes down to this end of the building to look. There's a huge load on this side of live load, which causes the floors to deform like this. And that deformation gets resisted by this truss up above, which has really good depth for doing that. So there's some really interesting proportions here. 
This span is about 300 feet. feet. The depth of the suspension element is about 150, in other words, half that much. The depth of this truss is about 30, which is about a fifth as much. And then the depth of this wide flange is about three feet, which is a tiny fraction, uh, or it's actually about one-tenth of the depth of this truss above. So the truss above is much more effective at resisting this kind of deformation than would be this deep um, I-beam in the suspension structure. So in, because of these proportions, we can easily ascertain what the functions are. The primary resistance under uniform load, uniform gravity load, is this suspension structure. The cables are dealing with the dead load. The wide flange suspension element is dealing with the coming and going of live load. Asymmetric live load is being handled by this deep truss above to prevent this kind of deformation. And basically this depth right here only has significance in that we can make this suspension element straight from there to there. It has two intermediate columns that are tending to introduce some bending, but it can easily span from there to there because from, in other words, from one cusp point. So we have a cusp here and we have a cusp there and we're able to um, span that distance with this deep wide flange section under the influence of these forces. But that's the only bending function that's associated with this. So it's kind of counterintuitive that this suspension element has been made into an I section because it really didn't need to be that. It could have been any number of different shapes that we might have wanted to pick. But I sections are fairly inexpensive and they're made out of the kind of mild steel that's needed to perform this function. And it did locally under uh, construction loads provide some stiffness against lateral force. So again, we have the compression elements up above which have been expressed by recessing the glass. The tension elements here have been sort of accentuated by bringing the facade out and making it look extremely delicate. This is what it looks like from below and this is a side view. Um, <clears throat> we mentioned here that the deep truss up above is what handles the asymmetric loads. We also mentioned that this is a very circuitous stress path. Um, a later structure chose to flip all that and turn the structure into a compression structure. So now the instant loads get here, they don't have to go all the way down to the bottom and then back up to the top and then down again. They have a much more direct stress path. Uh, and as a consequence, this structure, even though it's working in compression, ends up being more efficient than this one. We have to have the compression material there anyway. In this case, we've got it over here and we've got it all along here, but we're reducing the amount of compression structure and we're eliminating the tension structure. Except of course, these elements right here are acting in tension, hanging off the bottom of this. The other thing to point out here is these elements are there to resist wind load and also asymmetric floor loads, which might tend to make the floors deform in this way. In other words, they might push this arch in there and bulge it out there if we have a lot of extra load over on this side of the building. So these diagonals are serving the same function that this deep truss up above is serving in the Federal Reserve Bank building. This is the Broadgate Exchange House, by the way. This was designed by this the uh, Chicago office of Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. This structure was designed by the architect Burkert and the engineer was Leslie Robertson who also did the World Trade Center and a host of other really quite exceptional structures worldwide. Uh, this structure also had a cool feature that it could have an addition on the top here and that addition would be supported by an arch structure. 
and the outward thrust of this arch would tend to balance the inward horizontal component of that tensile element. So in essence, some of the burden was taken off of this truss, which is the compression element that's holding the towers apart because that outward force would then be provided by this arch. That concludes our discussion from chapter one, section six, types of structural action as they pertain to tension. So our final uh, video in that uh, subject area is on the Federal Reserve Bank.